Welcome to our 11 o'clock service. We are in Advent, and every week in Advent we have a, a theme. We start with hope, then love. This week we're going to be talking about joy, the joy of the Lord, and then peace. Uh, today uh, our scripture verses, our, our chapters, uh, our Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, and you're going to find that this is one of the most beloved scripture verses for, for Christmas. In fact, if, if you mention Christmas, this is, this is a must-have. You must have this this verse included in, in Christmas, and I love being able to, to give it to you today. It's, it starts off in verse 8 by saying this. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. As I mentioned, this is one of the most well-known and beloved verses um, at, we use at Christmas. Luke did a wonderful job of the, of the nativity and the gospel account of the birth of Christ. It may be like you, it's like my wife and I, as we thought about these verses, we remembered all of the Christmas plays in our church. Because from the time our kids were little enough to be, you know, just to be a shepherd or just to be on stage, our little church had a Christmas play every single year. And our daughter, Heather, and our son, Adam, played literally every part, every part that they could play. They were shepherds. They were wise men. They were Joseph. They were Mary. They played all the different parts, you know, from five, six, seven. So this, rem I, this reminds me of those, those great times, perhaps with you as well. Time with family to be able to, to see that there. These, these verses bring cherished memories of happy times, watching the story of the birth of Jesus uh, unfold for our, our families, our churches, and our friends. As I mentioned, the title of my message today is The, the Joy of the Lord. The Joy of the Lord. And our focus today will be this, this piece of scripture that we read today, where the angel says, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, but behold, I, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be uh, to all people. You know, why would the, the shepherds be afraid? Well, the very manifestation of the glory of God. We read about it in the Bible, and often people are afraid. This is why when the angel appears to somebody, one of the first things they say is, is do not be afraid. And verse 9 says that the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were, they were greatly afraid. You know, it's actually amazing when you think about it that the angel's words, do not be afraid, was enough to to calm their fears, to, to relieve their anxiety because they were seeing the manifest glory of, of God. You know, for example, in the scriptures, if you take a look at it, there's, there's different times we see this glory of, the, of God. We see it in Abram. Remember, Abram sees the, the burning bush. And, and he's 99 years old and says, God says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you and you will be greatly increased. And what is Abraham's response? Verse 3 says, Abraham fell face down. He fell down before the Lord. And then there's Ezekiel. We talked about this in Bible study just a couple weeks ago. Ezekiel, as recorded in chapter 1, Ezekiel is in Babylon. The Jews have been deported to Babylon, and he's along the river Kebar, which is right outside of Baghdad, present-day Baghdad. And, and he sees this windstorm coming out of the north, this, this, this thing going on in the sky. And there's this whirlwind, and there's four living creatures, and all four of them had eyes and faces on their, on their, on their, on their head. Uh, and then he saw above that the throne of God. And high above the throne was a figure like the Son of Man. And verse 28 says, And when I saw it, I fell face down. Matthew chapter 7, 17 records the time when Peter, James, and John went up with Jesus up into the mountain. It's the mountain of transfiguration. We talked about it just a few weeks ago in Bible study. This whole idea that they go up to this mountain alone with Jesus and suddenly 
with Jesus, Jesus is dazzling white. His white, his hair is glowing. His, his clothes are whiter than any, any launderer could wash them. And standing with him is, is Moses and, and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. And suddenly, out of the cloud, a voice comes that says, This is my beloved son in whom I'm, I'm well pleased. Well, what happens? Well, verse 6 records, it says, And then the disciples heard it, and they fell on their faces. And they were greatly afraid. You know, we shouldn't be surprised that when people have, see this manifestation of the glory of God, not only do they, are they afraid, but they, they fall face down. This, this verse that speaks of the glory of the Lord that's shown around them tells us something that's very helpful as we try to understand this idea of, of joy. Joy can be described a number of different ways. One source says that it's a feeling of, of great pleasure and happiness. Like a high school student, I went to my dictionary and took a look at what joy was. And it said that one source said that joy was an emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune. A synonym for joy was bliss or delight. What I found interesting was even the secularists. Secularists are people that don't have a biblical worldview. You and I have a biblical worldview. We take our cues from the word of God. That's how we see the rest of the world. Those are the glasses we look through. <laughs> We look through the lens of the Bible. But the secularists who do not consult the scriptures know that there's a difference between joy and happiness. You know, can we explain this way? Happiness is an emotion. It has to do with something happy in your life. Now, you can be happy anytime. You can go to the dentist, and the dentist can tell you that you don't need a root canal, and you can be happy. You can be happy for a short time. Joy, however, is different. It's a, it's a state of being. It doesn't have to do with the experience itself. The Bible has a lot to say about joy. It's, a, it's our key verse today. was, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Great joy, which will be for you and all people. The joy that these shepherds were to experience, and the angels said, was a, is, was a great joy because it came from, from God, from the presence of God. The joy that God brings begins with God, and as I looked through the scriptures, I found that there were 155 references in your Bible to joy. They start in the Old Testament, but often even the word joy has a modifier, has an adjective to it. it it's great joy, or exceeding joy, or like the one that says great exceeding joy. I mean, it's trying to describe something that's almost undescribable. Because it begins and it ends with, with, with God. You know, the last verse in the Bible uh, connect, uh, containing the word joy is one that we often use for benedictions. Benediction is how we typically close our service. And in Jude, Jude chapter 1 says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceedingly great joy. Great joy. So in our discussion today, I thought what I'd do is I'd take, a, I'd take a chance. I'd step out in faith a little bit, and I'd create my own definition. Is that okay? Sometimes, sometimes you have to do that. You just have to say, this is what I think joy is. So I, I, now I, I took a look at the Greek definition, and I, I understand you know, the Greek definition of joy uh, is an experience. Hara is the word in Hebrew that means joy. It has to do with a natural reaction to the work of God. But I came up with my own definition. And, and my definition is that joy is the revelation of the purpose and the presence of God. And if we take a look at the scriptures, especially when it says great exceeding joy, you'll see the thing that they have in common. It's a, it's a revelation. It's, it's something that they're experiencing for the first time. God is revealing it to them. Just like these angels revealed that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And it's a revelation of the purpose and the presence of God. So I like my definition. The Bible tells us that joy is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and, and self-control. The thing they have in common is they're all from God. These are all fruit from, from God. We'll talk about joy a little more with this definition, but, but, I, but I like it, that joy is the revelation of the purpose and the presence of God. Okay, we'll put that away for now. We'll take a look at some of the scripture and see what else we can learn from this very familiar verse. Verse 8, where we started today, says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So 
you know, most of us don't know much about shepherds. I, I'm a city boy. I don't know about you, but I, I grew up in the city. I mean, the only animals we saw were squirrels. I mean, that's, that was it. You know, sometimes a rabbit in the backyard. But we just didn't have a lot of animals to, as, a, as an example. But for people that know shepherds and know sheep, know that they have something in common. They smell. <laughs> the shepherds end up smelling like the sheep. They're, they're known to kind of stay apart, to stay by themselves. And that's probably why, because they ended up smelling like the sheep. However, these shepherds in Bethlehem were probably a little bit different. They probably still smelled like the sheep, but they had a, they had a purpose. You see, Bethlehem was only five miles from Jerusalem. The temple in Jerusalem is where they had the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb. Now, Passover, if you're Jewish, this is the main event. This is Christmas, New Year's Eve, the 4th of July, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, all the parades all rolled up in one. It was all about Passover. If you were, if you were able-bodied, you were to get to Jerusalem and be able to have the priest offer a, 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 a lamb for your Passover dinner. This was, a, this was a festival, a feast given down by, by Moses that was supposed to be celebrated every single year. It was to remind the Jewish people that they were slaves in Egypt and Moses had delivered them by the hand of God from the Pharaoh and, and took them out because of the 10 plagues. They took them out into the desert. But this was, was just to celebrate the idea of, of them coming out, this, this blood of the Lamb that was shed for them so that the angel of death would pass over. That's why it's called Passover. Now, the Passover lamb, did you know the Passover lamb was called the lamb of God? That's what the Passover lamb was called. This is why Jesus, it was so important for him to celebrate this Passover and to tell them, this is my body, this is my blood. You see, he changed the elements. Instead of the Passover lamb, it was now Jesus. He was pointing that in the future, we wouldn't be celebrating Passover, we would be celebrating the Lord's Supper with the body and blood of Jesus represented in the, in the wine and the, and, the, and the bread. The lambs, these lambs that, were, that uh, were sacrificed had to meet very strict legal religious regulations of the Jewish faith. For example, the Bible says they had to be a male lamb, no more than a year old. They had to be perfect. No spot, no blemish, no bones broken. They had to be the very best. Jesus is called, of course, the Lamb of God. John the Baptist, when Jesus comes down the hill to be baptized by John, John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the, the sin of the world. God gave him that revelation. That joy that John had was expressed by him saying, this is the, the Lamb of God. You know, and the Bible says that Jesus lived a, a perfect life, that he was blameless. He was free from all sin. That was Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. These lambs used for Passover by the temple priests were special. There were 265,000 lambs. Josephus records 265,000 lambs that were sacrificed at Passover in Jerusalem. About a million people came into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. 265,000 lambs. Did you ever wonder where did they get 265,000 lambs? See, people couldn't bring them in because they had to be perfect. They had to be inspected. The priest had to know that these lambs were qualified to be able to be the Lamb of God. Have you ever wondered? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Because I, I have the answer. See, Bethlehem was only five miles from Jerusalem. This is where the lambs were kept. This is where they kept the lambs for the Passover. The shepherds in the hillside of Bethlehem were keeping watch over the very lambs that would be used at some time in the future for Passover. History records that when the lambs were born outside of Bethlehem, get this, they were wrapped in strips of cloth. They were, let, they were wrapped in strips of cloth when they were born, and then the shepherd would take them to and place them into a stone manger. And they would remain there until a temple priest came to inspect the newborn lambs to make sure that they were perfect, that they were the right type of lamb, because they had to be perfect. They, they stayed in that feeding trough until the priest could actually come. That would be the sign to them that there would be a lamb that was wrapped in claws and lying in the manger. This is why the shepherd said, this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling claws and lying in a very manger. It's the very strips of cloth that the lambs were wrapped in is what Jesus was wrapped in, and he was put in the, in the manger, the very mangers that these lambs were. Oh, by the way, before we go on to the next verse, 
It, it, says, it says that uh, they were living in the fields. The shepherds were living in the fields. And perhaps you've been told by some skeptic, and you know, there's skeptics and then there's cynics, that say, oh, you know, you celebrate Christmas on 20, the 25th of December. That's the one day that Jesus couldn't have been born because they wouldn't be living in the fields in December. It's too cold in December to live in the fields. Right? Have you heard that? Well, well, I looked up the temperature in Jerusalem in December. Guess what it is? 60 degrees. 60 de it's like being in Orlando. Okay? It's like being in Orlando. So don't, don't pay attention to get cynics, especially cynics. Let's go on. This is the angelic announcement I read earlier, but I'm going to read it again. Behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You know, you won't hear this voice, this, this verse in the future without thinking about those lambs, those Passover lambs that were wrapped in the cloths and then placed in a manger for it to be inspected by the priest because they were going to be sacrificed for Passover. Notice the angel stood before them. He wasn't flying in the air. He was, he was up close and personal. He was up close and personal. His very first words were, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. The joy is coming. Great, exceeding, and great, exceedingly great joy. For unto you is born this day a Savior. Now, why was the angel, what was the angel announcing? Well, the angel was announcing the revelation of the purpose and the presence of God. That's how I got my definition. That's what the angel was announcing. He was announcing, he was revealing to them that Jesus, the Messiah, was, was born. This was the purpose of God. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus was the purpose of God before the foundations of the earth. That was the purpose of God. It was, the, it was revealed to the prophets that the promised Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Also, the prophet Isaiah said this. He said, Behold, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the revelation of the purpose and the presence of God. Jesus, the Savior, is born in Bethlehem. And what was their response? And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Glory to God. This is a common response when we have joy in our hearts. When we have joy in our hearts, regardless of your circumstances, our response is glory to God. Because there's something we know about the revelation of the purpose and the presence of God. You know, when I, when I read this scripture in my, in, my, uh, in my apartment, kind of putting this sermon together, I couldn't help but think about uh, a Charlie Brown Christmas. You know, <laughs> Charlie Brown Christmas, you know, it came out 57 years ago, 1965. Uh, my wife and I were talking about it. She remembers and I remember at the same time. We were both little kids. Remember when it first came out. First time we saw it. Think of the untold millions of people that have seen uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, but I did a little research, and, and here's the thing. Today, I, I want to tell you the story of how it almost wasn't done. How that animated special that we love to see every single year with Linus talking about, about Jesus being born in Bethlehem almost wasn't completed. The producer of the Charlie Brown Christmas is a guy named Lee Mendelson. He, he tells the story of Charles Schultz and the making of a Charlie Brown Christmas in, this, uh, in his 2012 book. In fact, here's a, here's a picture of uh, Charles Schultz. He's passed on by now, but he was a, he was a strong Christian. And, and the, the, the line, the Peanuts comic strip in our, the, the newspapers and the magazines was the number one comic strip in the country at the time. The number one. People would wait for it every single week. And it was always very, very clever, often very Christian as well. It was a, it was a very unique uh, comic strip. And, and uh, this 30-minute special, Christmas special, was actually the idea of Coca-Cola. 
Coca-Cola went to Lee Mendelson, who was the producer, and they said, have you and Charles Schultz thought about doing a, a special for Christmas, an animated special for Christmas? And Lee Mendelson, in his book, lied. He said, I lied, and said, oh yes, we've been thinking about that. So then they said, well, we'd love, to, we'd love to produce it. So he goes back and he tells Charles Schultz, and he says, I've got good news and I've got bad news for you, okay? The good news is that Coca-Cola wants to sponsor a 30-minute animated special Charlie Brown Christmas. And Charles Schultz says, well, that's wonderful. What's the bad news? And he says, well, they want it tomorrow. They want it tomorrow. Oh, so tomorrow, what they did is they wrote the script, basically the outline of the script, wrote it overnight, and got it to Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola put their stamp of approval on it, and they had three months to come up with the, the presentation, the finished product. So in three months, three months, they created the script, they recorded it, they made the soundtrack, and they created 30,000 animated cells. Now, I'm not sure how much work goes into that, but this is long before, long before the computer and animated you know, graphics and things like that, but, but they had to do it all by hand. But then came that famous scene with Linus reciting Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, the very verses that you have in your bulletin today. The producer and the chief animator complained and objected. They believed that Charles Schultz had lost his mind. He had crossed a line in wanting Linus to recite a Bible passage. The CBS executives also worried about that it was too long. They said it was also too literal. The CBS executives assumed Americans, especially kids, wouldn't want to sit through a spoken passage from the King James Bible. Mendelssohn told Schultz, and he wrote this in the book, he said, this is religion. It just doesn't go into a cartoon. But Charles Schultz looked back at him and said, if we don't do it, who will? We can do it, and we will do it. You see, Schultz had leverage. He had the number one comic in the country, and Coca-Cola wanted to use his product for their Christmas special. He wasn't about to capitulate on the part of the scripture, especially the Bible reading. The neck and neck executives finally caved, and they aired the special exactly as Schultz intended. And see, Charles Schultz was right. The Linus recitation of the gospel account of the birth of Jesus was the highlight. It was the cornerstone of the entire movie. This was, this was amazing. And it's, it's now become the most common on sequences of any animated show. Linus telling the true meaning of Christmas. Christmas. And that's what Christmas is all about. Charlie Brown, that's what Linus says. Do you remember the scene? Here it is. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. So I told you, I'm going to start working with kids more. I mean, this is, this, is, this is much better than the sermon itself. So the question is, why was that so significant? Why was that, those seven verses from Luke, why was that so important in this story? And why is it so memorable? And the reason is, is because it is Scripture. It, it's the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is not, all, not just important. It's altogether essential. It's, it's a, there's a promise made about Scripture, about the Word of God that's not made about anything else in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 55, 
The prophet Isaiah says this. He says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but, it, but shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. You see, Isaiah is, is, is comparing the word of God to something so essential that it's, it's water. See, without water, we die. Without water, the earth dies. That's what the word of God is. It's not just important, it's, it's essential. The truth of the water, word of God will not return void, the prophet says. It uniquely has the ability to change our heart. You see, the word of God is unique. It, it strengthens us. It gives us hope. It points us to the way of righteousness. It rebukes us. It corrects us when we're wrong. And it trains us in, in godly living. You know, ha have you ever wondered why the Christian is to be joyful always? That's what Paul says, be joyful always. Why are we supposed to be joyful always? It's so special about Christians. Well, Christians have the word of God. And the word of God, the Bible says, to be is to be taken into us and kept in our heart. The word of God is a, is a part of us. If joy is defined, as I said, by the revelation and the, of the purpose and the presence of God, then we have the joy of the Lord when the word of God reveals the very purpose and presence of God. That's what the, the word of God does. It's the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes. He comes because of the word of God, and he indwells within us. The Bible says that we uniquely are temples of the Holy Ghost. That's why we have, have joy in our heart. Or as Linus said, that's what Christmas is really all about. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the, the word.